We are currently in the heart of Oklahoma's severe weather season, a great time to review and discuss what's new when it comes to being prepared for tornadoes and what to do in the aftermath of a damaging storm. Here's moderator Reese Wetzel and his panel of weather experts. Thank you, Rich. And today we are joined by three guests who are joining us via Zoom. We were going to do this panel in person, but due to some severe weather uh, threats and inclement weather warnings, we are going to go ahead and move this to Zoom just so our guests can make sure that they're staying on top of data for Oklahomans. Now, I want to start off by introducing our guests. First, we have Rick Smith, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the NOAA National Weather Service Forecast Office in Norman. Then we are joined by Gary McManus, State Climatologist with the Oklahoma Climate Survey. And joining us also is Chris Hale, Storm Chaser with the Oklahoma Storm Chasers. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, Rick, I want to just get started here. Meteorologists and Storm Chasers were avid about people staying off the roads. How important is it for people to not be under underpasses and what can that have on an effect for people who are trying to watch out for the storms? Yeah, being on the road in any kind of severe thunderstorm, whether it has a tornado or not, is one of the worst places uh, you can be for a variety of reasons. Cars are very susceptible to being damaged or destroyed, even in a weaker tornado, and certainly large hail can do the same thing. And you're putting yourself at a lot of risk, and you're, you're removing a lot of the control you have over your safety when you're on the road. Um, overpasses are a horrible place to be. People naturally, and I get it, want to be covered up. If it's large hail falling, you don't want to get your vehicle uh, beaten up, so you're going to cover up with something if you can, but, um, and it's okay if a couple of people did that, but the problem gets to be when everybody does it, eventually the road gets blocked, and then we've got a whole different issue. So what our advice really is always, first and foremost, pay attention to the weather. Don't get in your car, don't drive if there's a storm between you and where you're going, or there could be a storm between you and where you're going. We do that for winter weather. We don't do it enough for severe weather. Your only safe option in a tornado, an example in a car, is not to be in your car in a tornado. Well, thank you. And Chris, I brings a good point. When you're storm chasing, how do you stay safe in your car? Or how are you making sure that you're following safety precautions? Well, uh, one of our, our, our uh, team roles is that we never uh, go alone. So uh, we all, always have a team of two. Uh, that way, you know, one's driving, one's uh, watching radar, you know, one's, you know, uh, navigating. And uh, we, we also, you know, look at the storm and uh, know our escape routes. Uh, that way, if we do get bottled up, we have that uh, route that we can take to uh, make sure uh, we're, we're safe as well, and, and, and as well as keeping uh, Oklahoma safe as well. Great. Well, Gary, that brings up a good point. We've had a warm winter and some are worried that that could lead to a more dangerous uh, severe weather season. Is that what you're seeing in some of your uh, reports and data is that this could be a more severe weather season? It was pretty, pretty wild last week with Shawnee and Cole. So I know a lot of people are worried. Right now, I don't think the warm winter correlates necessarily with our current spring severe weather season. It does correlate with possibly an uptick in severe weather in the winter, of course. We had a uh, um, record number of tornadoes in Oklahoma in uh, December, January, February, and those were really spread across, the majority of those are spread across three days. We also had an above average number of tornadoes in November. And if you look at the days all those tornadoes were on, um, they were all, you know, 10 to even 20 degrees above normal uh, December, January, February. So that heat is one of the necessary usually one of the necessary ingredients to get that severe weather and tornado. So I wouldn't correlate it with the severe weather season of the spring, but certainly when you see uh, storm systems come through with a lot of heat in the winter, um, you can get these types of uh, severe weather outbreaks that we saw just over the last few months. So does it feel like we're almost getting two tornado seasons and that the season is now split in some, some in the spring and then the rest in the fall? Well, I don't really think so. I, I think, and Rick, I think, would back me up on this. I think uh, meteorologists in Oklahoma say every season is tornado season in Oklahoma. So if we start to, to pin it down to just one season, it sort of gives you a sense of complacency, I think. But we have seen an uptick in, in tornadoes when the conditions are right. Um, I don't necessarily see a, 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 an increase in the, uh, in the tornadoes in the fall. We've had big tornado months in the fall 
in the past, we had a big tornado month, um, October, I think, 2021. I think we had a, a very large number of tornadoes in that month. So uh, just very variable uh, throughout the year in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, we had record numbers, as I said, December, January, February, March, we had one tornado, right? So uh, it just correlates with the day-to-day -day weather conditions, more or less. Yeah, of course. And Rick, I want to move into a new point here. We're talking about um, being alert and being aware, but a lot of Oklahomans and maybe some others have cut cable and now they don't have that weather interruption that comes on when they're watching TV, when they're watching sports. You know, we don't get that severe weather breaking news. What is the new message or new way to get people informed if they might get caught off guard if they're watching Netflix or Hulu or something that doesn't interrupt them? Well, one thing we know, as much as people have moved away from broadcast television or cable, uh, they're going back to TV when there's severe weather uh, going on. So if you are cutting the cable, and I did that several years ago, and you're going to depend on TV for information, you've got to have an alternate source. If you're close enough to the, to the TV uh, transmission towers, the antennas, you know, maybe getting an a external antenna or just, you know, an, to get the signal off the air. Uh, different subscription services, uh, streaming services have where you can get local television. But it brings up an even more important point is while television is probably the number one way people get their severe weather information, it can't be the only way. So if you've cut the cable and don't have access to local television, that's a, a, a prime example of why you need multiple ways to get a warning. TV is great and we work closely with all the TV partners, but if your power goes out, you're not watching TV unless you have a generator. So you've got to have alternate ways to get weather information. So we promote everyone having at least three different ways. TV may be number one, but it can't be the only one. So having apps on your phone, having a weather radio, uh, there's any number of ways that you can get warnings now aside from just television. Well, Chris, I want to move into a new point here. Um, we're talking about being prepared. How do storm chasers get prepared? I mean, what signs are you looking for in a storm to show that it's gaining strength or it's shifting? Um, what data do you go off of to make those conclusions? Uh, we look at uh, radar data. Uh, you know, uh, we look at, you know, uh, how, how big the hell size is, you know, and how big, uh, you know, uh, th this how, how big it's uh, uh, gaining strength. Uh, we, we also look at model data, you know, see, see you know, where it, it's heading, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in the future and, and things like that. So just, you know, a lot of data that we look at uh, if we're uh, out in the field. Now we look at, you know, like signs for you know, shelf clouds, wall clouds and things like that. And a way we can report that stuff for to uh, the, the National Weather Service. So you work with hand in hand with the National Weather Service. Well, uh, we uh, put uh, submit the storm re reports to them uh, via you know like uh, radar scope, or uh, we get on uh, the site directly and uh, submit reports to them. Well, I'm going to move into our next question with Gary here, and we're looking at these storms really this season. There seems to be a lot more out east. You know, you look at, at Oklahoma and that has not been necessarily a bigger target like we see. You know, I've seen tornadoes in Iowa. I've seen tornadoes all over the place. Is that meridian line shifting and that is that causing storms to move more east and almost shifting tornado alley? Well, I would be careful in saying that tornado alley has shifted. Um, they might be seeing an uptick. And I think uh, researchers like Dr. Harold Brooks at the National Severe Storms Lab here in Norman, they've looked at this uh, matter over the last uh, few decades and they do see a small decrease in the in the the, the high plains so the southwest kansas oklahoma panhandle texas panhandle an increase in the east um but that doesn't mean it's necessarily shifted from here uh you know we still had an above average number of tornadoes uh, over the last four or five months here in oklahoma with some pretty big tornadoes and all the bad things that come with that, fatalities, a lot of damage, hitting population centers. Now we are seeing that uptick in the uh, in the east, so what's known as Dixie Alley, an increase in that. And you know, that's that's something that, that goes along with that shifting of the meridian a little bit. That's, it's, it's, theoretically, that's, that's uh, something that's been talked about is um, the, the, the semi-arid uh, 
climate of the west of the 100th meridian, which is, you know, famously known as the High Plains versus the Great Plains, which is to the east of the 100th meridian. That's uh, been shown over the last few decades to have shifted uh, to the east, possibly all the way over to I-35. So we go from the beginning of Oklahoma Panel over to I, Oklahoma Panel over to I-35. So you might think that shifts that dry line position on average a little bit. It doesn't can't really account for all the increase in tornadoes across the, the eastern part of the United States, of course, um, but it can help uh, tell us about why we may be seeing that downtick across the the high plains. Um, but w when we talk about the shifting, though, it, again, it leads to a little bit of complacency. People think, well, Oklahoma's not really the place for tornadoes anymore. Well, just the last few months belies that sort of uh, thinking. So, uh, you know, the problems over the east, uh, of course, bigger tornadoes, more tornadoes, a lot more population as we get to the east of Oklahoma versus western Oklahoma. Um, but still, even west Oklahoma, as we saw over the winter, you got to stay alert because tornadoes still happen in our neck of the woods. Yes. Can I can I jump in real quick? Go ahead. Just just two quick things. Number one, uh, Dr. Harold Brooks and others were really trying to get away from focusing on this tornado alley, which is a relatively old concept. I mean, to me, tornado alley is anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains because that's where tornadoes happen. And number two, if we are going to refer to tornado alley. The, the headline has been, it's been shifting east. Talking to Dr. Harold Brooks and others, I think the real story is it is expanding east. We're not having a lot fewer tornadoes here in Oklahoma, as people in Cole and Shawnee, and we set a record just two years ago for the record number of tornadoes in a year. But it's just, it, it's expanding, I think is a better way to think of it. So it's almost like we're still getting the amount of tornadoes. It just might have been in the past few years, they weren't as as large or as as gravitating that some of them have been, for example, more El Reno. But this year, it almost seemed like that first storm, that first real big storm we had was kind of similar. Is that correct? I think we have to be careful characterizing, you know, season. People do think that, well, we haven't had a, quote, big tornado in Oklahoma for a while. I can tell you we've had big tornadoes. But one of the things that makes a big tornado more noteworthy and newsworthy and what gets at a higher intensity rating is it really has to hit something. So we've had big tornadoes that had they gone through densely populated areas could have very well been rated EF3, EF4 on the uh, enhanced Fujita scale. So uh, it's not all about, we can't just look at tornado intensity and say, well, we haven't had X number of these in a long time. So that means tornadoes aren't happening anymore. Or tornado alley is shifting or something like that. I haven't seen any change in the intensity of the tornadoes, the potential uh, intensity of the tornadoes, the frequency, anything else. Um, you know, nothing's changed with the weather. I mean, the Gulf of Mexico is still there. The desert's still there. The mountains are still there. So I don't I just don't want any Oklahoma to think for any for a second that your your risk of a tornado has gone down at all. Of course. And Chris, I want to bring up another point here. Um, really, I can pose this question to anybody, but I'll let Chris take it first. What are some tips for Oklahomans to have before a storm hits and even after a storm hits? Because I know most Oklahomans might not be prepared for what's after. Well, uh, first, you know, uh, they need to know where, where, where their safe places, you know, and uh, communicate uh, that to, uh, to, to, to their family, uh, have a plan in place to get to, to, to the uh, safe place. Uh, that, that's before but, uh, before the storm and after the storm, you know, just uh, if they, they got damage, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, get get help, you know, in, in replacing that, and uh, get get help, you know, with uh, provisions and things like that. I'll tell you one thing uh, that I have to say over and over is just if you see a day that it looks like there might be severe weather in Oklahoma. Just stay weather aware. Um, keep all forms of communication open. That means your favorite media source, your, your local National Weather Service office, your, your uh, uh, NOAA weather radio, um, and then your phone. Keep everything charged. Keep everything ready. And, and as Chris said, have a plan to, to act if severe weather starts approaching. The worst thing you can do is to make your plan five minutes before severe weather hits when you're – uh, you're very unprepared, um, and that puts you in danger. That puts your life, 
your family's life in danger. It puts other people's life in danger if you're out driving on the roads trying to get away from something. So uh, just stay weather aware on those days. Uh, don't take things lightly and certainly don't listen to any uh, uh, thing about, you know, it's not going to be so bad today because the, the forecast can change up until a few minutes before the event happens, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, I hear a lot of people talking about the cloud cap when that breaks. Rick, can you tell us a little bit what that means and what it means for severe weather? Yeah, you'll hear the cap mentioned a lot. And the cap is really just like a, think of it as a lid on a pot of boiling water almost. It's uh, uh, as, the, as, uh, as you go up in the atmosphere, some level above the ground, there's a layer of warmer air and that prevents or puts a lid on any of these strong updrafts or the, the, the first stages of a thunderstorm developing it prevents those from getting high enough into the atmosphere to form clouds and rain and, and eventually hail and lightning and things like that. Well, that's a lot of great information. And unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to thank you all. Rick Smith, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the NO, NOAA National Weather Service Forecast Office in Norman. Gary McManus, State Climatologist with the Oklahoma Climate Survey. And Chris Hale, Storm Chaser with the Oklahoma Storm Chasers. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.